was first elected to the Bundestag in 2009. We were particularly delighted to have her as a speaker today because she really does have a genuine long and abiding interest in nuclear weapons and in disarmament. In 2017, she became the disarmament spokesperson for Alliance 90 and the Greens. In 2019, she jointly founded the cross-party cross parliamentary group on the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, as I've mentioned at the beginning, she's now the Minister of State in the Federal Foreign Office. Uh, Scott, uh, Minister Coyle, over to you both. But thank you for joining us, Ms. Uh, State Minister Coyle. It's a great pleasure to have you here today. Can you hear us all right? Yes, I can hear you. And, uh... Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you tonight, and first of all, congratulations to the award you just received. So uh, it was great to listen uh, to the speeches, so congratulations. Well, thanks. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions to get us going, the warm-up portion, and then we're going to open it up, and I have a um, device that will let me see all the questions coming from the audience. So I want to start um, just by asking you very frankly, how has the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine influenced Germany's thinking and your own personal thinking about nuclear deterrence and NATO's nuclear policy? Well, well first of all, let, let me say what, what it felt like just after taking over office on December 8 um, to experience the 24th of February. Um, because uh, now there are people saying that they already, they always knew that it was going to happen. But uh, tell you the truth for the, for the most people and just like also for me, it was a surprise that he really did what he did. So. Um, it really made us look completely new at our uh, security um, uh, policy. Um, you asked me about the, the nuclear question. Well, uh, let me put it this way. I, I see that the, the, the existence of nuclear weapon obviously didn't prevent us from having this crisis that got us in, in a situation where we never really should have gotten into. So um, it makes clear that with all the implications, nuclear disarmament, there's still no alternative to it on the long term, even though that now we are in a situation where this is not the moment that we can sit down at the table because all the trust has been destroyed. All the European security architecture has been destroyed. So we don't have somebody on the other side that we could sit down with and talk about nuclear disarmament. But the whole situation makes clear that on the long term, there is no alternative because this, this situation that we got into it shows us that nuclear weapons are not the solution, but they're putting more danger to it. And um, also even, I would even go further and say that, that um, the, the person that is, or the leader that is not respecting uh, the international law, is not respecting humanitarian rights, is the one that profiting, at least he's trying to profit from it more than we can, because uh, uh, his playing with us with the nuclear threat um, and trying to, to split our societies. So we kind of have to stick together to make sure he's not able to split us and split our societies by, by, by trying to put that fear into, this, in, into us about the nuclear threat. But it's clear that on the long term, someday we have to go back to. So there's few things we can hold on to um, on the, on the um, disarmament architecture. There's not much left. We have to keep what's there to be able to rebuild it um, after the war. Well, if I could follow up on that, um, NATO foreign ministries and defense ministries never really uh, publicize what exact countries and what bases NATO nuclear weapons are stationed at. But it has been widely reported that at highest levels there are sometimes disagreements uh, about um, about who should hold nuclear weapons and where they should be, and, and 
Um, that was a common phenomenon in the post-Cold War er era. Um, is your answer about um, the unity that comes after the Russian invasion, does that suggest that the debates within NATO about uh, nuclear forward stationing are over and that there's unity uh, on uh, current NATO policy? Yes, I would say that that's the most important thing, that there's unity right now to, to say where this is not the moment um, to, to, to talk about where, I mean, there's no opportunity right now actually to change things. So unity in itself is a very high uh, value right now. So I would say, yes, there is, there is a need for unity on our side now to make all of us, especially our Eastern neighbors, to reassure, to invest in their, in, in their reassurance. Um, and there's, uh, that, that we don't have to lose out of sight what's gonna come someday after the war. Oh, thank you. Let's move away from the nuclear question for a moment and ask how the war in Ukraine has changed your personal views about the future of the German military. This is a, a conventional military question. Well, there's no question that we, that we need military and that we need to invest in it. Um, we had that before the 24th of February, but of course it uh, it changed the the need and the amount of investment because we have to do two things at the same time. The last years it was mostly, well, there is uh, the military has two main tasks. There is defense on the one side, and then we want to be part in our multinational structures in the United Nations uh, UN missions. Um, and now it's clear on the defense side, there is more to do than, than we thought we would. So I would say what it, it didn't change about uh, the, the, the green position towards the uh, the military has been that before, but of course the amount of investment that needs to be taken, of course, has the size has increased a lot. And there's a lot more support now with the budget to try to get into it and uh, to, to see that we, we need to do more um, to reassure our Eastern neighbors. And how much, what's, what are the domestic politics of this now? Um, are, how's the war affected the German people in terms of their views towards national defense and NATO? Well, I think so far we have a, a, still a broad support for what we do at the government, a broad support for supporting Ukraine, getting out of fossil energy, getting independent from Russian gas, and also from delivering weapons to Ukraine. There is a broad support, um, but of course this is the beginning of winter and things are not gonna be very easy. Um, the, the economic numbers and the, the social um, needs of the people are definitely increasing. And well, we, we of course we see the, the, the uh, the campaigns, the fake news, trying to really kind of push ex the, the extreme political um, parts. So we are expecting, we are expecting uh, a rough times. And um, what we do uh, as a government, as politicians, as parliamentarians, everybody is trying to tell, let's stay together, let's not fall apart as a society. People, that would be, that would be um, giving. Uh, the one that is trying <laughs> to harm our society, that would be on his positive side. So we need to stay together. Okay, well, but it's not going to be very easy because, of course, it, I mean, the gas bills, um, they're, they're extremely, uh, they, it's four times, five times as much as it used four to be. So this is getting for the economy, it's difficult, but also for the people, it's very difficult. We have a really warm day today um, here in Germany. <laughs> so when the weather is warm, everybody thinking, okay, you know, we can do it. But if this is going to be a cold winter, then a lot of people are going to be in trouble. Well, thank you for that, that candid answer. 
Uh, I want to encourage people in the audience um, who have their phones out, don't text home, but rather text your question for State Minister uh, Coyle. Um, and I'll be picking them up uh, on the iPad uh, momentarily. Um, you come from the Green Party background. Can you tell us about the evolution of your views on the role of nuclear energy in the future? Well, we don't see any role for nuclear energy in the future in our country. I mean, we, we made the decision two times to get out of nuclear energy, and we are kind of at the end of the process. So now we have two, two uh, no, we have three um, power plants left, so they are not really relevant um, in the question of electricity. We have a problem with the price of electricity, which that price is not made by, uh, doesn't depend on the amount of electricity. So we, we, have, we had an enormous debate on these last three plans, whether they should run until April or not. So there's been a decision made now that instead of being at zero, that was, that was the usual timeline was at the end of December, these last three would have been turned off. So now we are letting them go until April. Okay, so that's that's not the big issue. But what we're never going to do is that we're going to start reinvesting into new uranium, what you call it, the, well, you know what I mean, um, to start buying new, new, new uranium because that, that is definitely coming from Russia too. And we have a lot of European neighbors depending on that kind of energy. That's why in the sanctions, we couldn't include the uranium in the sanctions because too many European partners depend on it like we depend on gas. So that would be our red line and that, that will not happen. That if, it's, if it helps you know, to make everybody feel safer for the, next, for the, for the winter and for the next three months, um, then we are very practical about it. But we also see in what kind of trouble France is because the reason that we might have um, difficulties in, in Europe with the electricity is because France depends so much on the nuclear power plants and they're not, they are not running. They have 54 and they only have 50% of their capacity on. So now with our renewable energy from Germany, we're helping out our French neighbors, but we don't, there is no real solution. We don't know how they're gonna solve those problems. So that shows that, I mean, they would have to, when their 54 nuclear power plants run out of lifetime, they have, there's not really a perspective for rebuilding 54 new ones. So um, the future is a renewable and, and that's, there's nothing really that um, that changed about that. So it makes it just makes it the situation with the war makes it more complicated because we have to do uh, several times several things at the same time. Anyway, we lost a lot of time into building up the renewables, and now at the same time we're trying to get out of Russian gas. So this is kind of making it, it really tricky because we don't have any really time for, for all the procedure. And if 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 you have more time, then it goes more smooth, smoothly. But of course, if you do everything at the same time, then it's kind of tricky. But it is on the long term, there's no alternative. So for now, we're, we're producing, we are using coal plants for the next months to go through the winter. But then on the long term, we, we want to get out of it. Great. Um, well, I have one last question before we turn to the audience. And it's one that's quite different from the others that I've been asking. We had a superb panel earlier today about um, diversity and inclusion and efforts to have state departments and defense departments and nuclear organizations more diverse in many, many dimensions. I know that that's been something that has been of interest to you. Can you talk to us about how um, the foreign ministry and other um, important organizations in Germany are dealing with efforts to have more diversity and inclusion uh, in terms of gender and other uh, forms of diversity uh, today? 
Yeah, that's that's one of the the interesting issues worth about the feminist foreign policy that that we declared in our program and right. before we even before we even really knew ourselves or what we we're going to do with this feminist foreign policy, it kind of really developed a, a strong dynamic because everybody was asking now what it's about. So of course, in the center of all the debates, and that already makes it uh, quite efficient because. Even for ourselves, when we when we look at our work, our papers, our speeches, all of a sudden everybody thinks, well, there is feminist foreign policy. Did we, you know, did we think about everything? So it's kind of a, uh, um, a cross-topic um, policy that really influences our whole work, and it's so prominent. So that that already, you know, helps. You know, including it in in our work in our thoughts, but um, of course there's different um, uh, levels to it. There is uh, the foreign policy means, of course, also in the in the ministry itself to look at the gender quota. And we, as foreign minister, realized, okay, we are not doing very good. Obviously, we just um, we are just at the beginning of our term, but we saw there's a lot to do. So. Um, it's uh, it's not enough to have the first female foreign policy uh, foreign um, minister of the German Republic. This is already one good thing, but it's not enough. Of course, we need to to look at our whole personal structure. That so that what we're doing, but of course also in our work abroad in other countries, the networking between uh, powerful women. Me personally, I'm I'm responsible for Africa, and and I. I meet all these really um, powerful women that have a really good network already, where we can learn from how they are doing it. The 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 the, the woman African leadership network uh, is very impressing. So we kind of can learn from from each other, and of course also in foreign policy to to look at what um, women are doing at at the base of of everything. The, um, the, the lawyers, the female workers that that in all the countries work against um, uh, the the violence and the access to justice for for women, for children, and and for uh, vulnerable groups to support them. That's that's another part. So I would say there's these all these levels where we look at how we can progress. Well, thank you. I'm going to turn to the audience now, and I have a first question from James Acton, who has been co-leading this conference, so I, I feel um, he should at least uh, be able to ask one question. Um, and James asks, the, the minister said that NATO is currently unified around the need for non-strategic nuclear weapons in Europe, but under what political and security conditions, if any, should NATO be willing to negotiate with Russia about their status and potential removal. Would you favor uh, negotiations with Russia today? And, and what conditions would permit you to have more support or less support for entering into arms control negotiations over the weapons in Europe? <clears throat> well, I think right now at the moment we, we don't have somebody that we can talk to about it. So that's that's the problem about the timing. Um, but besides that timing, of course, that's a very fundamental question when it comes to nuclear disarmament is the, the substrategic weapons. Of course, that's what what we all plan to talk about and what also uh, your administration and your president wanted to talk about. And so there were proposals and there was hope and then all this was kind of stopped. So um, I don't know what it's going to look like and I don't know the timing when we will be able to sit down again and continue these talks. But as I said before, I don't see, I don't see an alternative. This, this war needs to be over and we need to have somebody and I can't, to be honest, I can't uh, imagine uh, Putin being the one that we sit down again and have any kind of trust rebuilding because this trust has been destroyed so effectively that I don't see that, that he can be the person that we talk to about it. Thank you. Um, from Oliver Meyer, 
What is the goal of Germany's constructive engagement with the TPNW, the Treaty for the Prevention of Nuclear, uh, 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 the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons? How can it be taken forward at the meetings of the NPT and the TPNW member states next year? How does Germany want to support assistance for victims of nuclear weapons and reme remediation of the environment, environmental damage done by nuclear weapons production and testing? Well, that was very, very important to us as Greens to, um, in the coalition a treaty, to have the possibility to be an observer um, to the um, uh, TP, TPNW. Um, and I think it was, it was quite successful because we, we don't want to split the, the countries, but we want to, be a, to build a bridge between the TPNW countries and, and, and the nuclear states and kind of trying to, um, to aim for the long-term goal, but not to, to let us, you know, being split apart, but work together. So we've been in Wendy Vendiana, we have been observing together with our friends from Belgium and, and Netherlands. And, um, and now we are, we're just about to look in what, what we can do about the initiatives for the victim protection and the environmental consequences. Well, we, we are open for it, but we need to find a frame that works, uh, you know, that since we are not members and we will not be members um, of the TPNW, we, will not, we need to find a frame where we can work together on these topics. But um, the proposals that have been made absolutely make sense. I think none of us would, would put that to question um, that we need to you know, continue on, on uh, working on the, the humanitarian consequences of, of, of nuclear arms uh, so we want to be part of it, but we still have to find out how we can do it as observers do, without being uh, members of the TPNW. Thank you. Janice Fort asks, at the outset of the Ukrainian war, many people of African descent were denied entry to NATO nations for safety while people were being invited, uh, while white people were being invited in large numbers. What happened to these people? And how is NATO holding their constituents accountable, especially given uh, your concerns about DEI in mind as it pertains to nuclear policy? How is NATO ensuring that all people in the world are safe? Uh, so the question is about the people you know, coming from Ukraine. Originally coming from Ukraine, people yes. of African descent were treated differently than, people for, than white people coming out of Ukraine. What has happened since that time, and uh, has anyone been held accountable, accountable for some of the difficulties that occurred in the early months? Well, we heard about it, and I heard about it too personally, but legally, I can assure you that we, we tried everything to make sure that everybody is treated the same. And legally, they were. The, the, um, the decision that the EU made about the refugees from Europe was clear that everybody that had a, a, a legal statute in Ukraine on the 24th of February was allowed to enter into the European community and stay and get a, a permit. Um, so, I mean, we tried to, to, to hear and to listen and to see if there was any really practical happenings, but I cannot um, confirm cases where this happened because we would have gone after it. So this is all I really can say about it. I, we were worried to hear it, but of course there's also um, news from parts that are interested and in giving us negative news. So it was hard to, to you know, verify, is, is there really something you know, true about it, how many cases do we have, and, and is it really a problem? And legally, the decision made by the EU was definitely the same for everybody that had a, a legal statute. Thank you. Uh, your comments um, about arms control uh, sparked a number of people writing, asking about the conditions under which Germany would support um, arms control. Is, is peace 
in Ukraine, for example, a precondition for having new arms control negotiation? Does Germany support U.S.-Russia nuclear dialogue under the current uh, circumstances? Um, have you thought through, given the comments you said about the practicality of negotiating with Vladimir Putin, um, about what conditions in the future might make it more or less likely that Germany could enter in, well, through NATO, that NATO could enter in to some kind of, of um, arms control agreements? Well, I would be the last one saying to, to there's a precondition bef before we, we talk about any kind of de-escalating arms uh, uh, control. Um, and if, if the, the, the United States government sees any possibility, for example, what, concerning the new START treaty to get uh, into talks that, that prevent from, from, get, from it getting worse or from saving new START. And, and so uh, that, would be, that would be in all our uh, interest. Um, that would be, I don't see a, a precondition to think about arms control, what I was saying is, if, if you want to have a, like NATO and Russia talking about non-strategic arms reduction, that, that's what I don't see with, with somebody like Putin happening again. But it has to happen. It has to happen. But I don't know when and I don't know with whom. But anything we can do on the, on the nuclear question and if the uh, United States and, uh, can save us from losing New START after losing so many other treatments, then it would be in all of our, our interest. Yeah. And we're, we're doing the same on, on other levels, like, for example, the little treaty of open sky I want to mention because I've been there on Monday. We just started the, um, the certification of the German um, observing airplane. So we've been fighting for this uh, capacity for so many years in Parliament. And now we have it. Now this plane is ready to work. And, and it's kind of tragic because uh, Russia and the United States left the treaty, but it's still it's still worse because it is a mechanism where we work together, and it's kind of a uh, a little bit of hope that we try to save for better times. So you're going to keep the plane and keep it ready. <laughs> Good. Um, I knew that this question would come up from a number of people, but I want to read Toby Dalton's because it's it's um, so well put. Um, at our conference, we had a debate about how to get out of the cycle of, potential cycle of escalation with Russia that could end up with nuclear weapons use. What are the best ideas that you've heard about how to help Putin find an off-ramp without compromising Ukraine's sovereignty? Well, if I had one, I would be really happy. And if somebody can give me uh, one, <laughs> that so far, I mean, we don't, we don't see us uh, as Germans or as Europeans in the role of telling the Ukrainians when is the right moment to give up territory. I mean, that is absolutely their sovereignty. And we are just clear that we are going to support their defense um, politically and humanitarian and also militarily uh, as long as it's needed. But we are not the one to tell them, you know, would you would you consider now please give up territory? I mean, we cannot do this. I mean, not as Europeans, but especially not as Germans with, with the history also we have in Eastern Europe. So um, we, are the, we are supporting them to be able, when they want to, to be on an eye level, to be able to, to have um, ceasefire talks or whatever comes up to that. Uh, they need to define the moment. I have a question for you as a, a lawyer, but also as a, as a German who, as you just mentioned, has a, ha, has an unusual history um, uh, because of the Second World War. There have been some discussions in the UN and elsewhere about creating a special prosecutor to um, issue 
um, a um, uh, complaint or to have a trial uh, in absentia of Vladimir Putin for the war crime of aggression. Most war crimes trials are about use in bello, that is, the conduct of soldiers. But both at Nuremberg and at the Tokyo war crimes trials, leaders were put on trial for the act of going to war uh, in an act of aggression. And most members of the General Assembly of the United Nations believe that Vladimir Putin is exactly that, a war criminal for starting a war of aggression against Ukraine. Have you or have others in Germany thought about this issue and how it could have long-term positive consequences, but short-term complicated consequences for all the reasons that you're mentioning? Yes, there is a debate about it. And um, uh, I don't think there is much of a question that, that Putin uh, has committed a war crime of aggression. But since the Nuremberg trials, uh, many things have happened. And we have uh, strong institutions, and we have meanings to um, investigate in war crimes on different levels. Uh, and we have to be careful that we don't look too much as like one, one single question and then weakening what we really have as institutions. Um, because what we can do is we have the, the ICC that is investigating and we are supporting those investigations. And we have our German national investigations that can also look into um, cases with no German um, connection. So this is the, um, the, the, what you call it, the world principle. So our uh, investigators are also putting like war crimes from Syria to trial in, on, in German courts and also war crimes committed in Ukraine on German courts. So they are looking into it. And of course, the third part is the Ukrainian themselves investigating and we are supporting them as well. So we have strong means and we do it uh, very early in this war that we are already investigating and um, uh, trying to make sure that we have all the material we need for the trials to come. So this is something I would say is a priority in my eyes. And there is, there is this one question about, and we can't put Putin on a trial in front of the ICC for war crimes. It's just the war of aggression. We can't do it because the states didn't agree on it. Uh, we can't put him to trial in Germany for um, the crime of aggression if he's not, if he doesn't have immunity anymore. So because he has the immunity in Germany and because of the ICC not being respond, uh, of, can't not um, trial on, on war of aggression, there is, this, there is this little loophole, I would say. But, um, I don't want to weaken the institutions we have, especially the ICC, to, to try to have a lot of um, investment into, into a special uh, tribunal that in the end can, cannot uh, be the answer because realistically, as long as he has immunity, we won't get him got put in front of such a trial. And if he doesn't have immunity anymore, then we can get him on other ways. So that's is, that's is what, what I would say to it. That this is not a this debate has not ended. It's still kind of going on. Well, I'm very glad that we had uh, a lawyer to explain that to us. So so thank you. That that um, I'm very pleased to know that you're thinking but, about I this. Hope I, I hope I managed to <laughs> it's kind of difficult to to explain it in a 
It's, when it's not it's, your mother language. But. It's difficult <laughs> for a native speaker to explain this uh, legal, these legal complications in English. And it's wonderful <laughs> to have uh, a non-native uh, speaker do so well in explaining this complicated situation. I have a great question from Beatrice Gegenbreiner, who says, after Russia's invasion, we saw many European nations stepping up to enhance defense, pledging to increase defense spending and forge a more autonomous and active role for Europe as a ge geopolitical actor. You've talked a lot about NATO, but that's not all of Europe. And you've talked a lot about US and Germany, but not all of Europe. Does Germany hope to follow through, she says, on the turning point in Olaf Scholz's words for Europe? Well, they, it's, we're trying for years and years to be better in our European defense cooperation. Um, if, that's the question, right? Um, right. If, if that's so, uh, since since I'm in Parliament since 2009, I've been on the Defense Committee and looking on the European cooperation question. So I know how difficult it is. So. We, we really want it, yes, because we're, as 27 nations in Europe, we are spending a lot more money on defense than, uh, well, we're spending three times as much as Russia. But, of course, we're, we're having problems with, with the efficiency if every nation is um, developing their own systems. So, of course, we do have an interest to be better in it and to, um, to cooperate better. But, the thing is, well, first of all, when it comes to defense and um, especially the, the defense industry, then a lot of a lot of national sovereignty is always involved. So it's 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 really hard when it comes to the question who is going to you know give up a capacity in order to have somebody else's partner have that capacity. Uh, and the most important thing for us Europeans, I think, is that we. Before we, we try to, before we focus too much on the industrial side and on the on the defense uh, um, industries capacities, we need to to be clear on our foreign policy. We need to talk about what we want to use our military forces for. What is our strategy? What is our the idea? needs to be clear, because if you try to develop weapon systems together without having a clear idea what you want to use them for, then it's then you're not going to be efficient in the process. So on that, so this is, I think, the most important thing for us as Europeans is that we sit together and we talk about our foreign policy to have really a common foreign policy. Well, this next question from Ankit Panda does take you even further, which is, um, what lessons are there from the Ukraine conflict today that might be applicable in Asia in the future? That might be a, a what? Applicable uh, to Asia. For example, what are the Chinese saying or thinking about the Ukraine conflict, and how might this influence thinking of states in Asia regarding the utility or lack of utility of the use of force? Yeah, well, I'm not the uh, expert for the Chinese, but of course the, we see that the Chinese, is, uh, they are of course watching the situation very close to see how are we going to react towards Russia aggression. So it's not only important for our European security, but it's also important for Asian security, how we react and how we, how we stand this question, because uh, uh, the situation in Asia is getting tighter too. So they're, they're, I think the Chinese are kind of in a waiting position, observing, and they're not, they're not yet going to the Russian side because they still need us as well. That we need to, with everything we do uh, um, uh, in, in Europe concerning the, the, the Russian war, we need to be conscious that, of course, also China and Asia are watching us very close. Uh, I have what may be a, a, an unfair question, but uh, I think it's an important one. Um, the great strategist Tom Schelling once said that um, people are very bad at making a list of things that they haven't thought about before. 
And my question here is, when you're looking out over the what's going to happen in the winter um, and what's coming up, are there surprises that you're worried about? Are there things that, that, that you're thinking about that you wish you had answers for? Um, another way of asking this is some people say, well, what's keeping you up at night? Um, and, and if you can be more specific about that, what are the kinds of surprises or the kinds of things that, that you're worried about that we haven't seen thus far in this conflict? Uh, between Russia, Ukraine, and with NATO obviously helping out so much in terms of armaments and other activities? Well, first of all, again, it, it, the worst surprise was the 24th of February because right. um, even, even seeing the situation, the threats before, uh, I mean, I need to realize that I wasn't really thinking that he would really do it. So, and I think I was not the only one in that situation. And uh, what you already asked all the, que the questions that, that put it to the point, I mean, what, how are we going to get out of it again? Of course, that without having more escalation. And as somebody that has been, uh, somebody like, yeah, like most of you, that, that I have been worrying about nuclear escalation for years while other people didn't you know, even think about nuclear escalation, um, of course, that worries me. Um, and uh, on the other side, I see that that uh, well, Putin tries to put that fear in uh, in our population to make them say, "Well, it's too dangerous. Let's just stop it and let Ukraine give up their territory, so we can uh, live in peace." Uh, it's not working with with the mainstream in Germany. It's not working for him. So. so People like us, we, we, we see the nuclear uh, escalation and the risks because we're in the, you know, the more you're into it, the more you know the risks. But on the, I think on the broader level in, in Germany, um, there is the, the nuclear risk seems quite abstract and quite far away. So they're more worrying really about how can we get over the winter, how, how can I pay my gas bill, how are the companies, how are they going to survive uh, with all the energy costs. That's what, what, what's mainly on people's mind. But you asked me personally, and of course, I, I wish I had an answer to that question about how do we get out of the cycle of escalation. That's, that's to me, that's the most important question. But are you worried about future pipeline attacks or chemical or biological weapons use? Those are things that um, people mention, but no one has good senses of probabilities or, or frankly, solutions. Yes, well, we've been putting cyber on the agenda since, since we've been in power, and my minister tried really to put that point that we need cyber defense really uh, desperately, and we. We had some really strange uh, events in Germany about the, our trains, the, the Deutsche Bundesbahn. There were some really, really strange attacks where you think, okay, this is, cannot be just, uh, it's, it's not just somebody playing with us. Somebody's really knowing what they're doing. So this is, yeah. It is something that we really we're trying to invest in in, in how you call it civic uh, we call it cat catastrophe protection for the civil uh, population. So we kind of neglected that for many years uh, after the Cold War. Nobody thought they would need it. So now we are investing in it again. But we need really to worry about cyber protection. Right. One, one last question is from Francisca Stark. What is Germany's approach towards future non-nuclear weapon state, nuclear weapon state bridge building efforts like the Stockholm Initiative? Well, we've also already, the, the, the last government was uh, really um, pushing the Stockholm Initiative and we're gonna follow up to this. We're, we're doing everything that, that we think can build bridges and can help uh, nuclear disarmament getting a restart again. State Minister Coyle, um, 
I want to thank you for staying with us in the evening, your time. You've had a, a large group here in Washington um, paying attention to every word and really appreciating uh, you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.